to come unto the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. This is a day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Somebody, Pastor West, it's good to see you, man. All right. I thought I'd put on a jacket to keep up with you this morning. Amen. Come in sharper than the bill of health. Amen. 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 So good. So good to be amongst the land of the living yet once more. And again, I pray that God's will is continuing to be done. Amen. And that we have geared our minds, our hearts, and our spirit to receive a word from him this morning. Amen. Amen. If you will meet me over in the gospel according to Matthew chapter number 18. I won't labor before you long. This is the first Sunday in August. This year has gone by so quick. And I don't want us to take for granted Amen. each day that God blesses us. Because every day that we are here is a blessing. My, my dad has a saying that I didn't know he had until someone told me the other day. You know that they said the best part of waking up is the Folgers in your cup. Mm. Well, my dad says the best part of waking up is realizing that you've seen another day. Amen. And so we're going we gonna to run with that. The best part of waking up is being blessed to see a new day. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Sister Katie. How are you? Good morning. The Gospel, according to Matthew chapter 18, when you have it, please rest to your feet. We're going to look at verses number 21 through 35. And the Bible reads, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I, did not, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Somebody said, that's a whole lot of times. Amen. Come on, talk to me this morning. That's a whole lot of times. Amen. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle an account with his servants. And when he had begun to settle the account, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay his master, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had, and that payment be made. Verse 26 says, Then the servant therefore fell down before, the, before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and, I, and I'll pay you all. Verse 27 says, Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him his debt. Verse 28 says, But that, but when, but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into the jail till he should pay the debt. Verse 31 said, So when his, when his fellow servants saw that he had what he had been what had been done, they were very grieved, and they came and they told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had heard, he had called him, and he said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I pity on you? Verse 34 says, And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Verse 35 says, so his heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. For a few minutes, I just want to use as a subject, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, good morning, good morning. but what are you going to do? Amen. Please take your seat. Father, we thank you now for this time that you've given us to share. I'm asking God that you decrease me and increase yourself. Speak clearly, God, that your people may hear your words. 
and that it may enter through the hearts of the souls of those that are listening and do what you set forth for it to do. We thank you now and give your name, praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we know and as we see, as we begin to study our word, we find that this particular passage of scripture is something called a parable. And there are many times when we give you a description of a parable and we just uh, uh, give you the description that it's just a good story that Jesus uses in order to be able to convey something that he's sharing with someone else, with the disciples. Have I got a witness? Amen. But here we need to find out that each parable that Jesus told, it served to bring truth, and that truth functioned like a knife separating those who wanted the truth Amen. from those who did not want the truth. Amen. And isn't that amazing to have a Bible tells us that the word is like a two-edged sword. Amen. It cuts going. And it cuts coming back. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing that we find a lot of Christians just that just like the word when the sword is cutting, but they don't like when they're being cut by the sword. Amen. And I come by to tell you that the word of God does exactly what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It sets you up to get you right. Have I got a witness here? Mm -hmm. So we find out now that Jesus uses this parable. And then we look and our assignment is to make the word plain. Mm -hmm. Psalms 119 and 130 says, the unfolding of your glorious word gives light. Their unfolding gives understanding to the simple. In other words, he's basically saying that we ought to make the word plain enough that even a child can understand. Have I got a witness? And so therefore, as Jesus began to help these disciples, he had to make sure that he was conveying the message in a way and in a form that they would be able to clearly understand because what they were about to embark on will require them to have precise direction, provide precise instruction, and be able to know how to put it into motion. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Many parables describe the kingdom of heaven, not just heaven the place, but heaven as a kingdom with purpose. And I need you to know that everyone that has been born in this world has been born with this thing called purpose. Amen. So everyone has a purpose. Your job is to seek God and find out what your purpose is so that you can walk in the fullness of your purpose. Amen. 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 So when you understand your purpose, you can walk in purpose on purpose for that purpose. Have I got a witness here? Amen. So now when we look at this particular passage, we understand that parables reveal spiritual truth through practical illustration. Mm. Amen, somebody. It, 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 it gives us spiritual truth mm. through practical illustration. Have I got a witness? Okay. It, it's, it's just like when Jesus told Peter to come forth when he was in the boat. He gave him practical, or he gave him, he gave him this spiritual or this practical uh, illustration by doing what? Walking on the water himself. And then as he uh, tried to get Peter into the spiritual dynamic of that, he told Peter to get out of the boat and come to him. So we looked at the spiritual dynamic of that and we asked, what did he use in the practical sense to gain Peter to have spiritual faith? What he did was he allowed Peter to see him do something that was impossible and then commanded Peter to do the same thing. By having something called faith that you can't see. Amen. Amen. Have, I, have I got a witness? So therefore, Peter had to tap into something that he was unsure about, but then he had to look at the practicality of what Jesus was doing, and in his mind he could say, well, if he can do it, then I must be able to do it too. Amen. But his mind still had to go back to the spiritual side and say, Jesus did things that man was not able to do. And if he commands me to do it, if I tap into who he is spiritually, then my physical side can walk in the practicality of what he is showing me right now. Have I got a witness? Amen. How many times have you prayed and asked God to bless you with something that you know in your practical sense wasn't going to happen? Hallelujah. Uh, somebody did that earlier this week. You was asking God for something to happen. You was asking him to move. You was asking God to show up. And you knew that if he didn't show up, wasn't nothing going to happen. But the moment you began to pray, God began to reveal to you some things that he showed you in the spiritual sense 
that he was able to do before and before and before. And then you were able to see the spiritual example in the practical sense and gain your spiritual faith by what you see in the practical, but what was really demonstrated in the spiritual. Have I got a witness? Amen. Amen. Am I moving too fast? Hey, all right. Amen. So now we know that regardless of whether or not sowing the seed hits us personally in our day-to-day -day living, just like the original audience, the parable requires us to decide if we press into eternal way from the scriptures we understand. Yes. Now, Pastor West, have you experienced this? It seemed like folk that got favorite scriptures is always them scriptures that's talking about them getting something. Mm -hmm. But when they come to the scriptures about they got to sacrifice in order for it to happen, they don't understand them. Yeah, My God says he'll supply. Mm -hmm. My God says if I ask, yeah. that he going to give it. He did say if you ask, but what did he say before that? He said, if my word abides in you, yeah. if you abide in me, mm -hmm. if you have a relationship with me, if you understand who I am, then you can ask me for what you want. Yeah. But if you don't understand me, how are you going to ask me for something that you don't understand where it's coming from? Mm -hmm. Come on in here, somebody. Amen. So what we understand is we can't just pick the scriptures that we like because we think it benefits us. Mm -hmm. But we've also got to have the scriptures that hurt us and cut us because those benefit us as well. Amen. So now, will we respond like the disciples who followed Jesus until his word seems too radical? Or will we be like Peter, Nicodemus, and the woman at the well and follow all the more when his words are hard to swallow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we look at this particular parable, we look at a parable in Genesis 127, and we think about this parable. We look at Genesis 127, and in verse number 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So in other words, watch. This parable was speaking on forgiveness. And we must understand that if God says in Genesis that he created us to be like him, we look down in John Chapter 14, verse 12, and it says, Most assuredly I say to you that who, he who believes in me, the works that he do, I, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. So now he says, I created you in my image. But then I go to the New Testament and says, But I also made you that you can do better works than me. Because I'm about to go, but the work has got to continue. Amen. So if he did that, and he was the pure essence of this thing called love, and he was the pure essence of this thing called forgiveness. And we were created in his image. Then that means we were created to forgive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have I got a witness? Mm -hmm. But when we look at this parable, we find, if you look at how this whole parable is lined up, Jesus uses this man that owed the master some money. And the Bible says that when it was time to pay the debt, he was unable. But look at how this whole thing was set up, Josh. They said that not only him, but his wife, his kids, and everything that was connected to him was now bound up because he owed a debt. Amen. Are you listening? Look at the circumstances that surrounded the fact that he owed somebody something. Now, it was something that didn't benefit him nor his family. But it was something that was going to create a problem with him and his family. Now, he begged the master. He says, Master, it, it just, just, just give me some time. Give me some time. And so now we find that the master did what God does. And they, watch, this is the spiritual side. Now the master illustrates something called grace. Amen. He gave him some grace and some mercy. And the crazy part about it is, why is it that God gives us something that we're reluctant to share with somebody else. Hallelujah. Well, who died and made you Jesus on the cross and gave you the ability, the power, and the authority to change what he's already put into place? Amen. Oh, I wish I had somebody who's been praying with me in here today. So now we find that this man was in trouble with the law. But his wife and his kids, it was just like when we got over in the book of Joshua. 
Uh, when we was looking at Joshua, when, when all of a sudden Achan stole something. Remember when Achan stole, the Bible says that him, his wife, his kids, his dogs, his, his gerbils, his, his guinea pigs, his horses, his donkeys, his gophers, his goldfish, everything had to die because of the sin he committed. Are you listening to me? So now what happens is this man here, he's facing punishment. His family, everybody is facing. But now his master gives him something called grace and mercy. He gave him enough grace that he forgave him. He didn't tell him, you owe me later. He forgave him his debt. He washed his debt away. He cast it upon the sea of forgetfulness. He told him that you don't owe me anything anymore. Go on and handle your business. How many times, Josh, have you given somebody that kind of grace when they owed you $2.79? And you told them 10 years later, go on. I ain't worried about that $2.79 because you gave them some grace and some mercy. But Chantel, there's some people right here, right now, that's looking at me or not looking at me. They sit here right now. Somebody owed them $3.42 12 years ago. And they still mad about their $3.42. But the problem is, uh, Mike, they're not mad. They say they're not mad about the money. It's about the principle. Well, the principle is forgiven. The principle is grace and mercy. The principle is God is the supplier of your needs. The principle is why don't you release yourself from the prison that you got yourself in because you're not forgiving them, ain't hurting them, but it's holding you up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bye, 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 bye. So Jesus is now using this as an example to say now the master has given him grace and mercy. How many times have you sinned before God? And you went and you were facing a bad situation. You were facing a bad consequence. But God, in your prayers, forgave you of all of your unrighteousness. He said, get up, dust yourself off, get back in line, and try it all over again. How many times have God forgiven you for the same thing that you haven't forgiven somebody else for? How many times have God said, I'm a God of another opportunity, then why are you a one and done yourself? I need somebody to understand that if God can do it, and if he said that we are like him and to do greater works, then that means you are supposed to do it. So when we look at this, he was forgiven. Chantel, then it says, as he was moseying all along. It didn't say he ran across somebody that owed him. Watch this. It didn't say he ran across him while he was in the marketplace. But he said he left and went and looked for him. Did y'all, am I the only one that saw that? No. It says he went to go look. He found one of his servants that owed him less money yes. than he owed the master that just forgave him. Amen. But now look at the scenario. When he was in the hot seat, he was in the hot seat, but hands was never put on him. But when he goes to somebody that owes him less than what he owed, he snatches him up and puts his hands around his... In other words, now he got... Let's get physical. <laughs> he got physical in the nature where he let him know, you owe me and I want my money. Isn't it amazing that this servant did the same thing to him that he did to his master where he fell on his knees and said give me some time and I'll give it all back but what I like about this is when he went after him he just went after him Amen. Amen. he didn't go after his wife, his kids he didn't go after nobody but him to show, me, show you just how out of order he was he, he didn't do what the custom was according to the parable, he did what he wanted to do to try to prove a point to somebody and the Bible says that as he threw him in jail, until he was able to pay him the kibbles and the bits that he owed him, somebody saw it and went and told the master on him. Amen. I want to catch this. I want somebody to catch this. So, so, so every time God forgives you of something that you don't forgive somebody else of, there's an angel watching and going to tell God that you didn't do to somebody else what he did for you. And therefore, I need you to understand that you're going to be called back to the hot seat. And the thing that you were forgiven for, now you're going to have to be subject to pay the punishment for, simply because if you cannot exercise 
God's grace and mercy, how do you expect it to come to you? Amen. Amen. When the Bible says, how do you expect God to forgive you of your sins? Mm -hmm. You can't forgive your brother of their sins. He says, he says, before you come to me about anything, you need to go get it right with your brother. Amen. Come on up and hear somebody. But ain't it amazing that you seem to be the one that, that you want, you're going to be the only one that's not going to be subject to that rule. You're going to say, God, well, you know my heart. Yeah, I do know your heart, but I know my word too. And my word says, you need to get it right before you come to me. Because if you can't get it right on earth, how do you expect heaven to move on your behalf? And yeah, 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 I read somewhere in the word where it says that when you walk up to God and you got unforgiveness in your heart and you begin to pray, that you are praying to somebody that ain't here. And you are praying and it's a prayer that will never reach past the ceiling. You are praying and you'll never get the results. You are praying and you'll never feel his presence. You are praying and you'll never find his hand moving. You are praying simply because you have unforgiveness. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Store the wedding in your heart. So the Bible says that now this particular servant now is back in the face of the master. But the Bible says to me in Matthew 5 and 7, he says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. I need somebody in here to know and understand that when you forgive somebody for something that they did to you, it don't matter how harsh it is. When you do that, God says, blessed are the merciful. And when you can extend some mercy, I need you to understand that when God says in his word that the, that the battle is not yours, but it belongs to him. I need you to walk in the blessing of the merciful and allow God to have the vengeance that he said he will have. I need you to walk in the mercifulness of who God is so that he can make your enemies your footstool. I need you to walk into the mercifulness of God because somebody will only see Jesus through the grace and mercy you extend to them. I need you to walk in the mercifulness of God because your blessings can be held up, locked up, and put away because you want to walk in unforgiveness. I need you to be just the way God has called for us to be. I need you to be forgiving in your heart. I need you to be loving in your heart. I need you to be willing to understand that it ain't about me, but it is about Jesus. Sometimes you've got to bite your teeth, grit your teeth together. Sometimes you got to bite your tongue. Sometimes you got to stick them four-letter words in your back pocket and tell them, don't come out. This ain't the place. You. Sometimes you've got to take your attitude and tell your attitude you need to chill out for a little while because I need God to move on my behalf. I need you to know that every once in a while, Josh, you got to tell your flesh, flesh be still in the name of Jesus because God is trying to do a little work through me. I need you to forgive when it hurts. I need you to give grace and mercy when you can't stand them. I need you to understand that God got a mission for you and whatever your purpose is, it may include you forgiving somebody. Whatever your assignment is, it may include you having to tell somebody it's all right and let their death be forgiven. Somebody in here yeah, needs to realize yes. that you're not where you should be mm -hmm. because you're still stuck in where you want to be. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And it's amazing that not forgiving you feels good. Because yeah. every time I look at you, I can roll my eyes and keep it pushing. And that is like, you don't add nothing to my life. Well, maybe they add a whole bunch to your life because if every time they're in your presence, it messes with your flesh, it messes with how you feel, your emotions get turned upside down, you better understand that you are a prisoner in your own jail and you're not allowing yourself out because you're not walking in grace and mercy. But yet God has forgiven you of some mess. God has forgiven you of some stuff that man will never ever forgive you for and you don't have the audacity. Mm -hmm. To forgive three dollars and forty-seven cents, mm. <laughs> but Brian, there are people that call you a bad name. Mm -hmm. But when I was growing up, there was a saying that sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But we got some folk. Pastor West is so full of unforgiveness, madness, and anger mm. that you call him a name and you didn't create in World War 14. Amen. You call 
calling my name and you may as well go ahead and pull out everything you got because it's about to go down, it's about to go down. Amen. But then you got some people that no matter what you do to them, it seems as if you cannot wreck their spirit at all. And I want you to understand that it ain't that they're so good and so godly. But what it is, is they trust God enough to know and understand that if I show the devil my hand, that he knows exactly how to counteract what's going on with me. So every once in a while, I got to put that smile on my face. Every once in a while, I got to lift up my hands in the midst of adversity. Every once in a while, I got to tell God, God, you got to help me with this forgiveness part on this one. Because this one right here, it cut me deep, long, deep, and continuously. This one, this one hurt me a whole lot of bunch. I went to sleep thinking about it. I got up thinking about it. But God, I need you to release it from me right now. What I need from you, God, is some grace and mercy to get past. Because I need to be able to extend some grace and mercy to get through. Have I got a witness? Uh, Josh, I got women right now that can't get a good man because they still haven't forgave the bad man. And I need you to know that that bad man set you up for the good man. So stop being mad at him and tell God, thank you for the mess he put you through so you can identify the goodness of the man that God sent you. Amen. Come on, Amen. Listen to me. Your job it's not to harvest and be God and cause and create your own rules. It's not for you to be the judge, the jury, and the executor. Mm. But your job is to stand in the power of the Most High God. Yes. Your job is to be what God has called you to be. Mm -hmm. And my Bible says that he called us to be the head mm -hmm. and not the tail. Yes. My Bible says that he's called us to be heirs and joint heirs with the kingdom. My Bible says he's called us to do greater works than he's done. My Bible tells me that when he called us, he says that now he's given us dominion over all things. And so since we have dominion over the things that are living, that means we have the power to allow them to see the examples of what grace and mercy is supposed to look like. And if you are a Christian that's going to church every Sunday and carrying your big Bible, got on your nice suit, parked in the front in your fine car, got your hands up and always shouting hallelujah. My problem is that you're walking around still unforgiving some folk. And if you want the folks that don't know God to get to know who he is, then I challenge you to forget about yourself and begin for forgiving somebody. I need y'all to ask God, God, what is it that's got me feeling this heaviness for that person in my heart? God, tell me what it is that makes me frown when I see their face. God, help me to understand why I don't want to be in the same room that they're in. God, tell me why it feels good when I see them suffering a little. God, I need you to come back here and help me because I want to be just like Jesus, the one that died on the cross. I want to be just like Jesus, that forgave the ones that spit in his face, gave him sour vinegar, twisted the crown of thorns on his head, pierced him in the side, gave him all of these whips, mocked him, sold his clothes. Then I got a witness, I want to forgive just like Jesus did when Pilate said, get him out of here. I'm going to wash my hands. Jesus still had to forgive. Forgive them, God, for what they're doing to me. Because what they're doing to me, they're doing unto you. Forgive them, God. Jesus laid there upon the cross in pain, in agony. He was beaten, but not defeated. He was whipped, but he wasn't outdone. He was hurting, but he still had power. And because of the forgiveness 
darkness. I like when the Bible says that when it got dark in the middle of the day and the veil ripped from the top to the bottom, the soldiers standing at the cross looking at Jesus, the Bible says, fell down on his knees because he understood the power of forgiveness and if they didn't understand before Jesus closed his eyes he said Father forgive them for they know not what they do you may not understand why you ought to forgive but be just like Jesus and say Father forgive them for they know not what they do Father, they hurt my heart, but forgive them, they know not what they do. Father, they hurt my pride, but forgive them, they know not what they do. Jesus gave them a great illustration. The Bible says that when the man on the other side that was a robber, for so long. Jesus didn't have a relationship with him. But the man says that the man says Jesus remember me when you go where you're going. The Bible says Jesus looked at the man and he says as of this day you shall be with me in paradise. What my problem is, Pastor West, before we can forgive somebody, we need a dissertation. We need a thesis. We need a five-page essay. We need them to write it down in a five-rate binder explaining to us why they need to be forgiven. But if we're made like Jesus, we ought to say, as of this day, all is well. As of this day, you have been forgiven. Matter of fact, I want you to know something. Josh, you let them know. One day, early in the morning, Jesus woke me up with forgiveness in my heart. In other words, I forgave you a long time ago, but we haven't been in the same proximity. So since we're right here, right now, I may as well let you know, you've been forgiven, yeah, God forgave you, even though you didn't know what you did, and since he forgave, I also have forgave God bless you and God keep you. God be with you is my prayer. Go in peace and be free. That's for me. I'm on to fulfill my purpose and walk in forgiveness. Issuing out grace and mercy. Have I got a witness? Yeah.